Charles Madigan is the author of Destiny Calling, How the People Elected Barack Obama. We are live back at Printer's Row Book Fest in Chicago. Mr. Madigan, here is the cover of your book. How did the people elect Barack Obama? Uh, basically, they got very angry at what happened in the eight years before he began to run. Um, so desperately angry that an opening was created that allowed someone to come from nowhere, supported by people who really knew how the electoral college system worked, got him the nomination, and then won the election. Was it inevitable that a Democrat would be elected, no eight in your view? I think it probably was, looking at the track record of the Bush administration and what people thought of it by the end. And they had had, they had, had a handful of crises that they never quite resolved with um, um, Katrina being one of them, national security being another, and finally the economy and, of course, the wars. Um, what surprised me during the reporting of the book was that I, I saw the wars go from the central issue to being almost not an issue at all and the economy taking over everything. So um, it was a very interesting process to watch, but you could see how that played out in the campaign. How did the people elect Barack Obama in the Democratic primary? Uh, basically, what the uh, Obama people understood is the mechanics of, of winning primary elections. And they understood that a delegate from a place like Idaho carries just as much weight as a delegate from New Jersey. So while Senator Clinton was looking for big states like Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and elsewhere, um, Senator Obama and his staff were out getting up delegates wherever they could get them, to the point at which once the campaign started and once it was pretty clear that momentum had developed, there was no way for her to catch up. So um, by the time June rolled around, he had the nomination sort of wrapped up. And, and that led all the superdelegates, who are the characters who are selected by the party and who are party insiders, sort of change their minds and shift to his side, too. So it was all a case of momentum. And I would argue momentum constructed on a Chicago model, which was all about looking at states as though they were wards, basically, and going after everything it could get. Uh, how did you approach the coverage of this election, of the 2008 election in Destiny Calling? Uh, basically, um, there are a number of things I wanted to do with the book. One of the important things was that I wanted to find my own way to recreate my own journalistic presence. Um, I did not want to be on airplanes. I did not want to be on campaign buses. In fact, I didn't want to be connected to the campaign at all. I wanted to be connected only to the people who were going to make the decision, which was the voters. So what I did was identify six or seven core areas, and then I went and, and um, dove into them and spent a lot of time in them talking to people and listening to people and then watching very closely what was happening in the polling there and what was happening in um, the campaigns. But I didn't spend a lot of time chasing candidates around. I didn't think that was worthwhile. It was all on TV, anyhow. That was not, it was somebody else's campaign that was happening. Who is Carmen Dedeau? Carmen Dedeau is a uh, African-American woman who lives in um, Pest Christian, Mississippi. And she lost everything that you could possibly lose in Katrina. Um, all of her cherished collections of her children's things, her house, it was all gone. And basically had, had um, collapsed into a uh, despair uh, that she described for me. I spent four days with her and we talked eight, ten hours a day about how she came to her political decision and how she reached the conclusions she reached about the campaign. That's very rare to be able to do that and I appreciate that she gave me that time. But by the time we were done I knew her. And, and I knew why she made her decision. I knew what role Katrina played in that process. And I also had a very solid story of, of exactly um, how serious Katrina was as a, as a problem the feds were not able to handle. 202 is the area code if you would like to tar talk with Charles Madigan about the election of Barack Obama in 2008. 585-3885 if you live in the east or central time zones. 585-3886 for those of you in the mountain and Pacific time zones. We have about 30 minutes with our guest. Um, how'd you find her? Carmen, uh, this is uh, one of those long stories, but I'll make it very quick. Um, one of the things I am is a musician. And um, when Katrina hit, a collection of friends and I sat down and put together a concert here in Chicago to raise money to give to people who were hit by the storm. And we had to find a way to give them the money. And I started looking around, and what I found, and this, again, this is the nature of the way journalism works. I found the Mennonites in Pennsylvania, and I understood um, from a few conversations and some reporting that they are really the first responders. No matter what happens anywhere in the world, there's going to be a Mennonite in a car going to it with a chainsaw and water. 
And so when Katrina hit, the Mennonites hopped all over this um, situation in Mississippi, sent 250, 300 people down. And by the time I was starting to research the book, I knew that they had done some good work. So we gave all of our money to the Mennonites. And we became like heroes of the Mennonites for that, that we raised at the concert. And um, so when it came time to find uh, Katrina victims, I called up a guy named um, King, who's the head of the Mennonite Relief Services. And I said, I need somebody in Mississippi who has a story to tell about this. He said, well, you need Carmen. There's nobody better than Carmen. And I, I called her, and she was gracious enough to say, yeah, come on right down. And so we had a, I don't want to say we had a jolly time because it's such a sad story, but, but um, she was remarkable. I mean, I've never, never felt emotion like that in my life as a reporter, listening to this woman talk about her loss and, and how she reached the depths of despair and then how along come the Mennonites and along come the Baptists and they rebuild her life for her. And in the process of this, she decides, you know, I'm going for Barack Obama you know, all the way, um, which probably would have happened anyhow because she's a Democrat. But um, um, her story is very compelling. Well, you found a lot of people in this book, and you tell a lot of personal stories. I did. Uh, another, Colonel Chamberlain, Colonel Bill Chamberlain, who I hooked up with in Maryland. I've known him for quite some time. Um, when I was an editor at the paper, I used him to write essays sometimes about the lives of soldiers. He was an infantry colonel in the first Iraq war. And um, very compelling guy and um, a good talker and a good thinker and about the fifth generation army officer and his family, conservative Republican guy. So um, one of the things that I wanted to do was find a voice to tell me about soldiers in warfare and government policy. And I called him up and I said, you know, Bill, I know you're a Republican and I know you've got um, your own ideas about these things, but I'd like to spend some time with you talking about what war means to soldiers and, and how federal decisions uh, affect their lives and, and why these wars are important. And he just went, launched into, on the phone, launched into an incredible lecture about the wasting of manpower. Um, and I knew right away I wanted to go hear him and talk to him because at that point, the polling numbers were supporting that approach that these wars were being handled badly. Um, and I wanted to find somebody who I could use to bring those polling numbers to life. And he turned out to be a perfect candidate and also a great character. He's, he's, um, he writes novels in his, in his spare time. And, and when, I, when I met him, he was fixing his, rebuilding his father's house. So I went out and hung with him for three or four days. And, and we talked all about exactly the, the relationship between warfare and politics. And he had, he had a very strong voice about it. And it was a strong voice that went all the way back to Pancho Villa. You know, it was a, an old military voice. Um, and I loved the time that I spent with him. So with all these cases, all these people, um, I had the time as a reporter to make a human connection. And I know people would argue, well, you lose your objectivity. And my argument back would be, well, you lose your objectivity anyhow. You know, you might as well lose it in a noble cause. Mm -hmm. and, and what I did was um, connect with these people who I can't tell you will be with me forever. I just keep touch with them, you know? How are you? What's going on? Carmen Dodeau, who was unemployed when I talked to her, got a job at the University of Mississippi. Another of the women I talked to um, who dropped off the side of the earth for a while, and I was very worried about her, um, finally showed up working in a counseling program for people with mortgage crises. <laughs> so they all, they all came out okay in the end, but um, there were some dicey moments as the economy got bad. But I just, I can't tell you, when you do a book like this, um, you make relationships and connections that you don't get to make when you're just a reporter bouncing around from thing to thing. Charles Madigan, give us a brief synopsis of your journalistic background. Well, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> it was, took 40 years to get it done. Um, it started out in a small paper in Pennsylvania while I was going to Penn State, working at night. Went from there to Harrisburg, to the paper in Harrisburg, then to UPI, and then with UPI to the Soviet Union, where I worked for three years in the Soviet Union, then the Chicago Tribune, um, for 27 years where I worked and I was, in, I was a correspondent, reporter, editor, senior editor, senior correspondent, every title of the day. I ran out of titles basically so I had to leave. But um, I was a columnist when I left there at uh, eh, three, four years ago. So at that point Roosevelt University came up and um, offered me a professor's position to teach writing politics and journalism and I thought well why not? because it left me enough time to work on things like this. Are so, you enjoying it? Oh, I love it. I can't, it's young people. Uh, well, Roosevelt students are not all necessarily young, but they're all fresh because they want to be there. It's not like an elite that, get, that got um, nominated to go to a good school. These are 
people who know it's a good school and they're paying the money for it and they want to be taught. So when you go into a classroom with them, they have something to tell you. You know, it's good.